John Norman from Talk Sport is our man to discuss all things first test. But first things first, you put out on Twitter, you were asking where's a good place to stop and stay for a night between Tauranga and Wellington. So you and Harmison are driving. So what's what exactly is the plan there, pal? Well, Harmy, um, Harmy lives at the very north of England. You can't get much much further north than Ashington. It's I, I think it's probably about twenty miles from Scotland, and um, he, so we're talking about splitting up the journey because it's a good six and a half hour journey if you don't stop, seven hours maybe. And he's like, mate, I used to play Sussex, which is on the south coast, and after a game of 50 over cricket, jump in the car and drive back to Ashington. So he's just like, I'm driving the whole way. I don't care. I'm used to it. Let's bring it on. So I was like, okay then. I'm more than happy to sit in the back and fall asleep for a bit. Okay. The other thing is, is that our roads aren't great, mate. Um, and just be very careful. Uh, you get some stretches of State Highway 1, which is our major highway, which are actually a motorway, which actually have two lanes and a median strip in the middle, which is safe. But a lot of it is just a double yellow line, and you put your life in the hands of the idiot who's coming the other way. So just be really careful. Yeah. New Zealand drivers are yeah. not good drivers. They're very aggressive. And the roads are potholy, and the infrastructure here, as you can tell by what you've seen over the last couple of weeks, is falling apart. So my advice is to drive slowly, be careful, and if dickheads are behind you wanting to overtake, let them go, mate. Good advice. Having driven from Whangarei back to Auckland um, as uh, day turned into night, I found that last half an hour or so one of the most terrifying stretches of road I've ever encountered. So... um, I'll be more than happy to uh, to be driving in the sun and also taking your advice. All right, let's talk about the first test then. And I, I mean, oh, yeah. I, I'm laughing, John, <laughs> and I'm laughing because I don't know else how else to, to react. That was as big a cricket lesson as any test match I've ever seen. It really was like watching the first 11 play the third 11. Yeah, I mean, look, can you imagine what it would look like, that scorecard, if Tom Blundell hadn't performed that? quite brilliant knock in first innings. I mean, you know, you were 83 for five or so, 178 for seven. Um, It could have been a lot worse. I mean, bear in mind that it it went perfectly for England in terms of they could declare um, their innings or or, or things were wrapped up at at a perfect time. You know, they declared so they could bowl at you for the last hour and a half of day one and they were bowled out. Um, you know, Basball was put to one side for a good hour or so, good hour or two, while England just made sure that they they were they lasted all the way up until dusk on day three as well. And then, you know, it was over to the bowlers. It reminded me a little bit of watching Ashes cricket from years gone by when England would be just about clinging on. You'd kind of fool yourself they were still in the game. And then as soon as conditions switched the opposition would just ram home their advantage. It's almost like they were fooling you for two and a half days. And then it was like, no, we're going to shut the door now. That's exactly what happened to England. And unfortunately for New Zealand, it's, it's not looking good in the short to short to midterm, is it? This England side, uh, when you consider, you still got to try and fit people like Johnny Bairstow or Mark Wood or Joffre Archer into it. Um, And then the New Zealand side, I mean, I've heard and, and I've spoken myself a lot about, you know, should Will Young, come in to replace Henry Nichols, you know. I'm not sure that's I'm with the greatest respect. I I'm not sure that's gonna that I'm not sure if Will Young had played in this test match that uh, the, the, the the gulf between the two sides would have been narrowed appreciably. it's the bowling though, isn't it? That's really the area. When you uh, when you when you think that in another day or if it was this game took place last year, it would be Jameson, it would be um Bolt and uh, it would be Henry. You know, alongside Saudi, that's a completely different uh, setup. I'm not saying that they would have won, but the gap between the two teams certainly would have been narrow because it was the bowling that let New Zealand down in the first on the first day, um, and then the batting followed suit really in second innings. It's uh, there's a lot going wrong with New Zealand cricket at the moment, but you know things can change pretty quickly. If you consider where England were this time last year, um, you know there's always hope. Yeah, two wins and I think 12 losses since winning the World Test Championship. It's just, I mean, it has been a slide ever since then. I mean, we, you know, we can't ignore that and we've got to tell the truth about this. Uh, just harking back to, you know, you did mention the, the baseball there. God, I hate, I, I'm, 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 I'm an old grumpy man who hates that. But 
when you say you didn't ac- actually see it, do you think that England were even slightly more orthodox in this test? To me, they won it on day one why, by attacking our bowling. 300's not a great score, John, in a first innings in any test match. Maybe it is in India on these kind of turning tracks. But the chance to bowl at us under lights with that pink ball, they had it on the first day. Yeah, absolutely. But New Zealand went in with two two debutants, you know, and two debutants that bowl gamely, but their records or form never suggested that they should be playing test cricket, um, you know. And uh, Wagner isn't an opening bowler. He's he really struggled, you know. He got better as, as as the innings progressed, but essentially, you know, you're bowling two lengths, two lines, and England need absolutely no. Um, uh, you know, no indicates any no invita- more invitation to start hitting boundaries. And the same thing happened on the, the morning of day three. It was clear what Wagner was going to do. It's unusual, to say the least, to see people taking on the hook inside the first half an hour of a of a of day uh, of a day's Test cricket. But you know, two for a hundred from ten overs. You know, I was I asked the question, who's got the best bowling figures here? Wagner has picked up two wickets but gone for 110 overs, or Saudi hasn't picked up any wickets but he's only gone for 44. The answer was neither were particularly good, were they? But uh, and that's they were the bowling figures from your two best bowlers. So there's so much wrong there. There's so much wrong. And then of course the batting. You know, I'm not sure it's an elephant in the room because it's been discussed at length. But Kane Williamson doesn't look like the Kane Williamson that uh, that we saw when we were last here in 2019. And the same could be said for for a lot of the batters there. So, yeah, yeah, problems wherever you look, really. Yeah, as you say, Matt Henry comes back. Look, I mean, the bowl question is just, it, it's got to be dismissed to the boundary like your batsman did to our bowlers, mate. It's not happening and it can't be allowed to happen. He's already decided that he don't, he don't want to play. I'd, I'd get him back for the one-day World Cup because I'm a, I'm a selfish, pragmatic man when it comes to that particular tournament and the fact we've got so close. But when it comes to test cricket, we've got to build for the future. And this is what is going to, it is going to involve some pain. Don't also, don't, you know, also lose sight of the fact that, you know, our best bowler is Saudi and our best batsman, Williamson. And these guys are going to be gone after the One Day World Cup as well. They'll be chasing that One Day money as well. So this is just a period of transition for New Zealand cricket. And I, I just don't know at the moment whether we've got the players, John. We've always been on the ground when it comes to cattle. You know that. I mean, every now and again, we cobble together a pretty good side with one or two world-class players. But it's not as though we have a factory line of these guys waiting to play. No, and it's a huge problem. And you've you've led the world really in your approach to balancing the needs of the player and the, of the team. I think this one you've got wrong, though. I just don't think it's 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 sustainable. It was sustainable when it was all about letting your players play in the IPL during a period of the year where you don't play cricket. You know, okay, go and earn your <clears throat> go and earn your money in April and May in in the IPL. And if you want to go <clears throat> and play in England or the CPL, that's absolutely fine too. Just make sure. You're back here and you can play cricket for New Zealand during the months of November to, to January or February. You know, the SA20 and the uh, International 2020 or whatever it's called, that's completely changed things. The IPL is going to be stretching out to three months before long. So so what are you going to do? You know, I mean, Trent Bolt lives a mile from the ground. You know, I, I'm hearing different reports whether he wanted to play or whether he didn't. But at the end of the day, he should have played. And you're, we're approaching a brave, a bright new world of, of cricket. And these SA20 is not going anywhere, nor is that UAE league. This, is, this problem isn't going, going away. And as you say, if Trent Bolt can be... I mean, essentially, what, what, what you're going to get to is a point where test cricket is just basically a training ground for, for T20 domestic leagues. You know, come and play for New Zealand for six months, do really well, and then you can, you know, go and earn your money in, the, in a T20 league. And that's not really good enough. So, you know, it's a problem. It's a huge problem. But uh, as you say, I've, I've said it a few times now, but it does seem like Test cricket is moving into an era where you're going to get three full-time cr- Test cricket nations, uh, England, Australia and India, and everybody else is going to be playing part-time. John, you don't know, forget, you're going to have, John, this is John Norman go, from TalkSport. Don't look, let's just draw a little parallel. You know, we had stories coming out last week about Rico Ioane, the All Black Centre, 25 years old, uh, off after the World Cup to go to Japan. Of course, he's denied it because, of course, you always do deny it. But look, we're looking at a generation of people that aren't like 
you and me, and we have to accept that now. Uh, you know, the the idea of the silver fern, you know, wearing, playing for your country. I mean, I know they speak all the right rhetoric, but it doesn't actually mean as much. Having a, a you know an Instagram account, a whole lot of girls following you, getting a lot of cash in the bank, thinking that the world owes you a living and you, and you can retire by the time you're 30. You know, a lot of these kids have never, or I call them kids, have never had a job, mate. They've, they've never worked. Their work has been playing sport, and they've been told that they're a prince or a princess since the time they're 14 years old. This does have an effect on you. I just don't think that the lure of what you and me think is the lure is the lure anymore. It's it's not. It, it is a lot more selfish and it's a lot more self-centered. And and we either accept this or we sit here and we howl at the moon, John, for the next two decades <coughs> till you know people finally forget what our names are and we forget them as well. Yeah, but I mean, you're right. But then if the opportunities were there 20 years ago, then exactly the same thing would have happened. I don't think it's a generational thing in terms of in that regard. I just think that Back in the day, if you you were just a self, no, mate, they're just a, they were they're no more self centered now than they were 20, 30 years ago. They, they, they're no more interested in cash now than they were 20, 30 years ago. They're no more interested in anything. They, look, Darren, Darren Goff says, look, what would you rather do? You know, would you rather bowl four overs for a million quid in front of a packed house, or would you rather bowl for forty overs in front of a fifteen hundred and get four grand? It's just common sense. You know, this that that is. If, if you are the best in the world at something, you want to be able to a earn money for it. You want the glory, and you want to be able to you want to be able to perform in front of packed houses. I've seen the crowds here in New Zealand. When England aren't here, there is no crowd. No, there is no That's crowd. No. That's it. Yeah. You know. So why would you want to do that? Nobody wants. You know. It's like well, who would want to be an opening batter? Playing, you convince me right now. As you're my dad, you 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 convince me right now. You can go out there in the backyard with your brother and play slog sweeps, in which case you're going to hit it over the fence, probably get a T20 contract, or you can sit there with a straight bat and keep batting it back to me and defending your wicket. What I mean, let's be honest about it. You know, you're talking about the candy versus the carrot, aren't you? You are, you are. But where where you are right, and where players do need to focus and just just hold back a little bit, is, you know, there's got to be a little bit of give and take. You know. You've got to have a position where the players do feel that they do that they owe the game something because the game has given them everything, and that's that's where it is. Like these players coming through now, they you cannot have a position where players don't want to go and play for these A team in these A team leagues. Uh, you know, New Zealand A that they don't want to go and play for the Lions. They don't want to go through the representative stuff. You know, you. You, you do have a problem if players get to about the age of 18, 19, and they're like, nope, don't want to do that. I just want to go straight to the T20 stuff. That's where it's you need to give and take because there is investment and time and money from a lot of people to get these players up to the standard where they do have the choice. And as soon as the players forget that, that's when the, 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 the fabric of the game is, is really going to start to erode and, and disappear. And then everybody loses out because the players aren't going to be – the players aren't going to be. <clears throat> look how many players are playing in domestic T20 leagues around the world. English players. I think you know during the SA20 and the I, I, uh, international T20 and UAE, and the Big Bash is going on, and the Super Smash is going on. I think there was like 70 English players abroad. Wow. Now these players are kind of like thinking, yeah, we're we're the you know we're in control of our destinies here. They need to remember how they got to that position, and they got to that position by doing things correctly and working within the system. Don't then get to a point where you can you've got a little bit of more control and then try and break the system. That's when everybody loses. All right, then let's talk about a second part of it. Let's talk about what we're going to do, New Zealand, to combat England at the Basin Reserve. The pitch, you know, supposedly is meant to be better. It's not a pink ball test. It's not a day night. With Matt Henry does come back. Can England play better? Have England got more in them? You know, you saw with the bowling that we that we couldn't cope with the way that Anderson and Broad came at us. I mean, you know, is is it an impossible ask from here for New Zealand to either win this test or even save and save the second test? Well, look, you know, they say in cricket your greatest strength is often your greatest weakness, and you know, we have seen at times that England's approach to batting can be slightly um, a little too up tempo. So there is a there is a chance there from a, a New Zealand perspective. You know they, they know the conditions better than England. If there's a breeze, they should be more suit, They should be more used to bowling in it. And of course they're going to bolster their attack. Matt Henry will definitely come into the the game. But you know again we're talking about Matt Henry Henry here, who for the last five years has been the full guy in New Zealand cricket, and now he's being held up as a savior. You know he's how many how many tests in a row has he played? You know he's always the one to uh, to be jettisoned. 
and partly because you've got so you've had such rich bowling stock. So I think we should bear that in mind a touch. But it's the batting for me that is the huge problem for New Zealand. You know, even more so than the bowling. Can uh, because the England bowling is so frighteningly consistent. You know, you've had you've got Jimmy Anderson and Stuart Broad with thousand wickets between them, and actually, I'd say Ollie Robinson is is, is the, you could say he's the best bowler. You know, so um, you've also got you know Jack Leach is is is, is going to be a a threat, um, and then of course you've got Stokes as well. So I, I hope for a better contest, but I have just got a horrible feeling. You know, we showed we did see a lot of fight from New Zealand on, especially on day two in their day-night test, um, a lot of fight. They were really clinging on for, you know, a good two, two and a half days, and then they were blown away. It's get, it gets to a point where you've already won nil down. You can't win the series. This is a proper two-test square quick. You know, what happens if England, at the end, win the toss, decide to bat, and at the end of day one, or, you know, 370 for four or something? How much fight have New Zealand got left in them? That's the question that I'm not 100% sure about. Um, how much fight and desire have they got to get through that test match? If they're if they're properly, absolutely well well behind, but you know it, it is Test cricket and and inspired spell. I thought Saudi bowled really well in this series, this this Test match, and he got no reward for it. So you know maybe he bowls the same or or a little better, and he and he picks up a bagful, you know, and then suddenly the pressure's back on England. Who knows? Who knows? But it's the gulf between the two sides looks like a large one, and you know this is the first series, and England have played. One, two, three, four. This is the fifth series in the McCullum Stokes era, and this is the first series that I've been really confident England would win. Um, and nothing that I saw in this day night test has made me think otherwise. Awesome, dude. Appreciate that enormously. Thank you so much. Drive.